Hey everyone, welcome to Facebook Live tonight. We're doing a, a good talk tonight about uh, breast implants and a little bit on breast implant illness. We'll just wait for a few more people to live, uh, or sorry, to join us, and then we'll um, we'll start with some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, Trish has given me a whole bunch of um, questions here that I'm gonna pull up and just refer to them as we go through. All right. So one of the big things with breast implant illness specifically is a lot of the misinformation and disinformation that's around. I think one of the biggest issues with breast implant illness is um, a lot of people who post stuff online aren't necessarily uh, factual with their information. A lot of it tends to be fear-based um, facts, fear-based um, type of type of um, discussion, which isn't really that good for patients, not good for anxiety, and it doesn't really give good facts overall. Um, so I do see a lot of patients come to the practice talking specifically and asking a lot of questions about breast implant illness, and I was really quite keen to get on top of it and just have a really frank discussion about how I look at breast implant illness and love to look at uh, what things we can do to help educate patients and just get everybody on the same page about, I guess, some of the dangers of breast implant illness, um, some of the dangers of breast implants, and uh, some of the, I guess, the hype that's really surrounding it. Um, so we'll start with some of the questions that were, that were put on. Um, so first one is, um, are some breast implants more susceptible to breast implants than others? Or breast implant illness and others. Um, I think for the most part, I think one of the big issues here is um, what we sort of need to define what breast implant illness is. And the issue is, I guess, really, um, breast implant illness is a is, a, is sort of a, a vague collection of symptoms. Um, there's no real test for it. There is no uh, defined blood test for breast implant illness. And there's nothing that you can sort of put your finger on for it. But a lot of patients do approach me and tell me that the breast implant illness itself is, um, or they, you know, they've had all these other kind of vague symptoms, brain fog, they feel fatigued, they feel tired, they've got um, um, sort of a, a lack of um, energy anymore. And, and they feel like maybe it might be one of those things that's happened as a result of their breast implants. And um, possibly, it, it could be, you know, if they lost their breast implants or they had them take, taken out, that they, would, they wouldn't um, have any more of these symptoms. Um, and I think it's, it's a, a lot of stuff is, is obviously published online by, by various people. And not all of it is medical and not all of it is, 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 is realistic. But I think, um, you know, defining breast implant illness or what is it, you know, how, how, what's going on with that. Um, and I guess from a, from a, from a, clinician point of view, I've got a slightly different viewpoint on it. I think the public has a, has a very defined view on, on exactly what, what they think. And um, I've got a little whiteboard behind me, so I'll, I'll just turn the camera. We can, we can go through um, what that is. And I'll start, I'll just write some things down and we can, we can use it as a, as, a, as a starting point for the discussion. So um, one of the big things with, with breast implant illness is I guess when patients approach, um, they generally have a few symptoms that they that they go at. So the way I would generally define it is if we start with um, breast implant illness sitting here. So we'll just call it BII. Okay. Now the public and a lot of patients, when we talk about breast implant illness, there's this whole collection of symptoms that they have, and symptoms that they have are things like the fatigue. Fatigue is a very common one. Um, other things they get is the brain fog. Um, things like, um, you know, this vague sort of pain or, or vague uh, issues that they have sometimes with their breast implants. Um, and then uh, other things that they can have, they, they sometimes complain of thyroid suppression. Um, I'm not really sure what that is, um, but it's, it's can certainly be 
part of this conglomeration of fatigue and brain fog and just not even have enough energy. So low energy. And this list kind of goes on and on and on and, and, and some people have all kinds of other things that they like to add to it in terms of, um, you know, sort of what it's all about. The way I look at this is if we have breast implants and we're, we're not really too sure how to sort of go through it, the way I would break it up is to look at it the other way. So if we've got the breast implant illness symptoms up here, we've got this kind of vague description here, but you have implants, let's separate this into breast. We'll separate it into capsule. And then the last one are the implants. So when we look at these three things interacting together, this is kind of the way I would look at it. So the breast implant illness is, is what patients come in to discuss, and this is what I think is the best way to, to rule out problems. So when we look at breasts, we think of all the things in, in the breast that are outside of the capsule and that are outside of the implant. So certainly breast tissue, some of the things that can be very common are cysts. So some women have very cystic breasts, and cysts can sit right near the capsule, and if they rupture, if they cause problems, they can cause a lot of inflammation. So that inflammation back onto the capsule can cause issues here. Um, in some cases, some women will have things like mastalgia. Mastalgia is a very vague description of pain, and that can be a whole host of things. Um, I talked to my breast, um, surgery colleagues and they tell me that nostalgia is a very common presentation of just generic breast pain, not really too sure why. Certainly if we've got breast implants, that can be something that can be a problem, but sometimes it's actually part of the breast that, 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 that is the issue. Um, it can be things like infection, okay? So these are things that, that can naturally happen as a, as, a, as a background event and they can also cause some of the pain. Um, of course, the, you know, the one thing we always worry about and that we want to rule out is cancer, okay? Breast cancer is slightly different from ALCL. ALCL is, 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 a, is another discussion altogether, and we'll definitely go through that. Now, when it comes to the um, capsule, this is probably the next stage, this can go on and on, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quite a long list that can happen here with the breasts. Um, the next one is with the implant. So I'm gonna jump over to the implant side because this one is, is probably equally as important. With implants, really what we want to look at here is we want to look at are the implants ruptured or are they unruptured? If they're ruptured, then clearly that's an issue and that's something that we definitely need to, um, we need to um, deal with. A ruptured implant is, is, a, is an implant that's going to cause pain, there's going to be silicon leak, and that silicon generally will leak back through the capsule. Um, if it's unruptured, um, there can still be you know, issues with that. Maybe the implant's moving around, it hasn't adhered well to its uh, capsule, and it's, 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 as a result of that movement, it can cause a little bit of pain. So that can be an actual implant um, a movement issue or a placement issue, and these are some of the complications that can sometimes happen with these implants. The problem is we're starting to get a few arrows here that are going towards the capsule, and we're getting a few arrows of, of exactly where the problem is. And if you read much about implants, if you've looked at implants, the one thing we always want to worry about uh, and want to rule out is do you have a capsular contracture? Um, capsular contracture, or for short, CAPCON, is, is what everyone likes to refer it to, or that sometimes you read online, you see these things called CAPCON. That's the, the one thing that, that will potentially cause problems. Why does capsular contracture happen? Capsular contracture is one of those things where if there's an issue with the, the capsule, so has the capsule had an infection, has the capsule had a bit of ruptured silicon get in and around it. When those sort of events happen, your body has to create scar tissue to try and wall it off. And that's just the body's natural reaction to injury, to infection, to all those sorts of things. As a result of that scar tissue, um, all the, the, the scar tissue that the initial inflammatory response happens, um, all, those, all that bit of scar tissue, um, specialized cells develop. Some of those specialized cells are called fibroblasts. Fibroblasts will turn into 
myofibroblasts. And myofibroblasts, part of them is that they turn into muscle and muscle contracts with time. And that's just what scar does. Scar in your body, if you get it on your skin, if you get it anywhere else, scar tissue as a general rule contracts. That's just, that's just how we're built, unfortunately. And because this capsule that sits here, capsule is mostly made out of scar tissue. And as a result, unhealthy, unhappy, infected, ruptured problems cause capsular contracture. As a result of all of this capsular contracture and, and, and issues that can happen, what we do find is capsular contracture causes inflammation. Now, why is that important? Inflammation is probably the biggest issue here. Inflammation is the one thing that is, um, leads to all kinds of problems way up there. Um, it, it is the, the one thing that your body has to put energy in. Your body is putting this constant energy into those fibroblasts, the monofibroblasts, putting down more collagen, putting down more scar tissue. And as a result of that inflammation, um, it sort of distracts your immune system. It distracts the rest of your body in, into believing that this big problem is around this capsule and you sort of get these other vague symptoms that come in. So with most patients that I see who come in with these symptoms, a lot of it is actually right here in the middle. It's because of an unhealthy capsule as a result of maybe one or two other things. Not the result of this thing, it's the result of usually the, an, a very unhealthy, unhappy capsule. Other things that can happen to the capsule, things like trauma. So capsules can get injured. Capsule is a, is a living um, object. It has blood supply to it and it has cells that surround it. And that cell needs oxygen, it needs blood supply. So if for all kinds of reasons, you've been to the F45, you've been cycling down a hill and hit a tree at a really high speed, that can actually injure the capsule. Of course, if that injury happens, right there, right back into the inflammation. Once we get that inflammation, we've got all kinds of distracting issues that are constantly happening around that breast implant, causes pain, causes all these kind of vague symptoms. And as a result of that inflammation, we have um, um, these other events that happen in your body that you perceive as you know, toxic problems with the implant, all these other things that, that you sometimes read online. This is really just where the problem is. It's right there. And sometimes just taking them out, giving it a reset, letting some time off is, is, is really where we need to go. A lot of patients will ask me, well, what happens if we um, take them out? Will my symptoms go away? And the answer to that is, I don't know. And this is, the, this is probably the hardest part to answer is, will the symptoms, will the symptoms leave? So how I generally would look at that is if we look at, you know, the degree of symptoms, and this is generally what I see with a lot of my patients uh, with capsule contracture or, or CAPCON. And if we look at the number of symptoms that you've got and we look at time, so this is over the, the, the longer time spread, a lot of times these symptoms will, will come and go, they'll fluctuate, they'll be kind of up and down. Then let's say here at that point, our implants come out. So that's it. Let's take, let's take it, let's get totally get rid of the implant and, and we're here. Now we generally see three groups of, of women um, who will go through problems after getting these implants out. The implants, all those symptoms will generally drop down and they'll sort of stay down. And I would say that in this stage, group one, this is going to be a lot of the, the younger patients that I, that I would see. And these are the implants that, um, these symptoms that kind of just go away. The next one, the symptoms go away, but then some of them come back. And those are the ones that, again, a little bit unpredictable. I'm not really too sure where that's going to go. So we call that group two. Group three is where the, those symptoms drop. There's a bit of a honeymoon period, but then a lot of them come back. And I would say in this group, these are the, more of the, the patients who have actual medical problems. This is one where we've actually got a thyroid problem, we've got autoimmune problems, got auto, you know, issues. The implants are out, but we still have those issues. And I would say by far, these are gonna be the younger patients. So the young patients in their, in their 20s and, and, and early 30s. And these are the patients in the 50s, 50s and 60s. Those are the ones where we'd say, yeah, you know, some of this inflammation, some of this stuff has actually unmasked an actual medical problem that's going on. 
but we don't know which way it's going to go. But as a general rule, younger patients. As a general rule, slightly older patients. Um, it's also related to how long that implant's been in and how long you've had symptoms. So if we were to look at um, implants that have been in for 20 years and you've had these capsule contractures for a long time and, and a lot of inflammation for a long time, um, it's likely that you're going to have problems for a little bit longer afterwards. But it is still unpredictable. We're not really, you know, it's, it's really tough to predict exactly which way it's going to go. But as a general rule, I'd say that that's the pattern that I'd see with most patients, most of the younger patients, most of the slightly older patients. So we'll get back to the original question. And the original question here was, are some breast implants more susceptible to breast implant illness than others? Well, not really. We go back to where we were. It's the capsular contracture that's the issue. And the capsular contracture can be as a result of a whole bunch of things. The things that prevent capsular contracture are things like good technique when those implants go in, um, taking care of the implants to ensure that there's no trauma to them. And, you know, if something comes up, there's nothing wrong with seeing your specialist that you originally saw to get those implants taken out um, or changed. There is an algorithm that was originally described where if we did see a capsular contracture on our um, uh, breast implants, that we would change implants to a polyurethane coated. That is a, is a very well described algorithm. Take out the old one, new one in is a polyurethane one. I'm not a big fan of polyurethane implants. I've never put them in and I, and I, and I generally won't. Um, so usually if there's a capsular contracture, we have to have a really good discussion about whether or not we want to put a new implant in if we go to a bigger implant uh, or if we do implants at all. Uh, and that's a, that's a hard discussion because obviously if you've had implants, there's a reason why you had them in the first place and it's, it's whether or not you want to try and risk it again. So just to answer your question, Nancy, if we do a capsular contracture, does the, does the whole capsule need to be removed? And I think in that case, yes. If you do have a capsular contracture, the, the, the idea is a, is a total capsulectomy. And for most patients, if they do come in with a problem, then yes, I would always attempt to do a total capsulectomy. The type of capsulectomy is, is variable. So capsulectomy is, um, can be done in various techniques. So a lot of people are big advocates of the on-block capsulectomy. On-block is just a technique. So I think it's just the same thing as um, any other technique that we do in surgery um, for breast reductions, for example. There are many different techniques described. Some of them give you know, varying, varying results, but I would say that um, um, capsulectomies as an on-block, as a general rule, is just a technique. Um, good things about it is, yes, the whole um, implant and, and, and um, capsule does come out. The bad side is it's a bigger incision as a general rule um, and can be a lot more painful as a, as a, as a post-operative uh, thing. Um, I, I would tell most patients that it's unnecessary to do an on-block. Um, some patients do read a lot of things online about all the you know, bad things that are in implants and all the rest of it. I think a lot of that is hype. I think a lot of that is, a, to be honest, a lot of it's clickbait. I think some websites do like to post those things for I'm not sure what reason, but it's not necessarily based on any sound medical evidence. Um, it's, just a, it's, just a, it's just a technique. Um, for me, um, I don't talk to patients in or out, but I just give them the counseling that, you know, you can just take an implant out, do a total capsulectomy, and it's the exact same outcome as an on block. But some patients, they are very, very, very adamant that they get it out, and that's fine. I'm happy to do that. But, you know, there's always a plus and minus for both of those. Thanks, Renz. Good to see you. <laughs> um, we'll move on to the second question. Second question is, does it depend on the surgeon's procedure protocols and methods as to what your risk for breast implant illness is? So I think the lead into that is that, you know, does breast implant illness happen? And again, it just what breast implant illness for me means is an unhealthy capsule, and it's usually a capsular contracture. For whatever means it's, 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 it's happened. I would say that the highest number of capsular contractors that I've seen uh, would be with um, old implants, so implants that are usually greater than 10 to 15 years, uh, implants that are ruptured. Um, implants that are generally put in overseas, it, you know, it, it's, it's tough. I would say that generally the implants that have been put overseas, I would usually see them quite early. Um, some of the 
uh, guys in Australia, certainly some of the um, non-surgeon cosmetic surgeons, I would say that um, you know they, they have their their share of complications as well. It doesn't mean that plastic surgeons don't. Um, but I think in terms of technique, there is a new described 14 point method of safely inserting an implant. And a lot of that is just no touch technique. So it's using Keller funnels so to make sure that the implant doesn't touch the skin. It's having meticulous surgical technique, changing your gloves, using betadine dips, then using all the things that you absolutely need to do to have not only a safe um, operation, but also to make sure that when you put these implants in, they touch nothing else but the package and the patient. And that's by far the most important. Having meticulous technique, if you wanted to change sizes intraoperatively, it's using a sizer and not putting new implants in and out and changing the pocket. Once the implant is opened, it touches nothing but the Keller funnel and then the patient. And using that meticulous technique, of course, make sure that you know, the, the risk of contamination is extremely low and that's really what we want to go for. We don't want any bacteria sitting around that implant because then there's a risk that, that it, those bacteria can grow and go on to cause a capsular contracture. As a general rule, early capsule contractures are probably a result of um, maybe a technique that was, you know, a little, bit, a little bit sloppy or a little bit dirty. And we do see those in a lot of the earlier inserted implants. And I think in recent times, we don't see as many. Um, so most of that is, is to avoid capsular contracture and to avoid the problems associated with those is to have a very good technique and follow the 14 point plan that's been set out by some of the um, implants. So the next question, um, I'm massively worried about breast implant illness, but really want implants. What can I do to make sure I don't get it? So the only thing to, best thing to do to avoid it is not to get implants. Um, that's, and it's a very, you know, it's, it's a blunt answer, but to avoid any problems with the implants, we just don't need it. Are there other alternatives to implants? There are. Um, we, as plastic surgeons, are um, now allowed to do fat grafting on native breast tissue. Um, and how we do that is, and why we haven't done it up until recently, is because most, most surgeons' medical indemnity has not covered them for surgery up until now. Um, and as a result, it, 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 we really don't want to be doing operations that aren't in patients' best interests. However, um, there is good data from European and American uh, plastic surgeons that suggest that fat grafting is very safe, um, as in it doesn't cause any problems and the risks associated with transferring the fat are minimal. Basically, just the surgical risks without any long-term risks. The risks of having implants long-term, of course, there's issues with you know, the implant itself, so will it rupture, will it not? Uh, implants with capsule contracture, implants with the implant moving, all the things that we would be worried about with those. I think the issue now, that's a very, very hot topic, are uh, the issue between textured implants and non-textured implants, or smooth or nano-textured implants. Now, textured implants, I, I, I think they've gotten a very, very, very bad rap. Um, that being said, there is now evidence to suggest that the texturing on implants themselves, breast implants, um, which is the same um, texturing on other implants that have been used in the body, um, it might in fact be that really significant macro texturing that is the problem. So there is a case report of buttock implants getting ALCL. So um, one uh, woman in the United States, she's recently come down with a, a late seroma in her buttock implant and took those implants out. And sure enough, she had ALCL in that buttock implant. Um, so clearly, the, the, it's not necessarily the location, but it's, it sounds like it's the actual implants and that texturing, which is the, which is the issue. So if you want to avoid those things, um, certainly with breast implant illness or, or breast problems, you know, we can always avoid implants. Um, but if you're desperate to get them, make sure you get a, a non-textured implant, um, smooth or a nano-textured implant um, currently has better evidence for not um, ending up with ALCL and for um, not having things like breast implant illness or bad capsule contracture. So what that looks like, um, and this is no sort of bad plug against the uh, breast implant manufacturers, 
But this is one that looks like, or this is a, a macro textured implant. And you can usually see that little bit of a fuzzy coating on it. That's, a, that's very much a, a texturing, a very aggressive texturing on that implant. That's a macro texture. This is a, a smooth implant. You can clearly see the big difference between those two. So it's a nice smooth implant. And then this is the newer generation. This is the nano texture. And you can see they're a little bit um, more opaque than the um, smooth round implants. Um, and these, what these feel like is they feel a little bit like these textured implants, but they don't have the same kind of texturing. And they act like a bit of a friction device inside that pocket. Um, Pluses and minuses with these, and this is something that surgeons need to sort of get their head around when you use these, because all these devices have to be used in a very particular fashion. So they're not the same from a technical point of view. These ones, because they're textured, we can, we can get away with a little bit in terms of the pocket. You can kind of cheat the pocket a little bit more and, 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 and be maybe not as precise. Mostly because when these goes in, they glue to the tissues. So once they go in, they shouldn't move. If these things start moving, that means we've got something called a double capsule. What that means is an actual capsule forms around the implant within the capsule that was formed by that. And as a result, these things act like a smooth round implant. It's not really what they were designed to do. They were designed to go in and essentially stick to the inside of the, of the tissues and not move. These ones are designed to do the opposite. They're designed to have a little bit of movement. And as a result, these, um, um, pockets need to be very precisely made. In fact, they're generally, I generally underdo them so that these, the, the physics of it is that these things can push back a little bit on that capsule. And so these ones have to be done very, very precisely. So a lot of it is just is choosing surgeons who are familiar with it, with the, with the devices and the, and the technique that needs to go along with them. Um, the next question, um, so I've seen the breast implant illness Facebook page with almost 100,000 members, and it seems like a really big issue in the medical industry seems to be ignoring. Are breast implants safe? And how can so many women with similar symptoms be making it up? And again, this comes down to sort of our whiteboard here with our definition of what breast implant illness is. So again, that big conglomeration of um, symptoms, so the fatigue and the tiredness and all that other kind of stuff, I think the, the public goes back to, you know, that, that nice encompassing idea of breast implant illness. But from my point of view, we just need to look at the three things that are there, breast tissue, capsule, breast implant. And we need to look at each three of those individually. Some women, they get a lot of cysts in their breasts and we need to think maybe, look, maybe these implants aren't for you. If you, these cysts are ruptured or if they're causing issues around that capsule, we can be getting a lot of inflammation that is really going to be an issue. If the implants are ruptured, then it really needs to go. You know, those implants, that, you know, some women with ruptured implants refuse to take them out. They still have pain, not surprisingly, but they don't want to take their implants out because they, they like the shape and they like the size, which Look, it's a personal choice, but at the same time, you can't really say you have breast implant illness. You've just got ruptured implants and you've got a really bad capsular contracture. And the rest of it kind of lies within the capsule. So if the capsule is injured, so if it's been injured as a result of, you know, a big F45 boxing routine, or if it's been injured as a result of a, a trauma while skiing or riding a bike or whatever it might be, then those capsules generally really don't repair well. Why don't they repair well? A lot of it comes down to the, the type of tissue that's there. So around our body, this is a bit of a tangential explanation, by the way. Around our body, we've got uh, blood vessels that were born with and that grew with us in, in, as, as embryos. And those blood vessels, be it veins or arteries, have three very distinct layers. And they've got little muscles. They're controlled by um, nerves. They're controlled by various um, substances that can float around our body, like adrenaline and everything else. The blood vessels that form around a capsule don't have that same kind of control. So if they get injured as a result of trauma, as a result of you know, anything that might cause a problem to that capsule, they don't heal very well. And as a result, we come back to that inflammation cycle that we talked about earlier. And that inflammation just drains your body and causes you to unmask a lot of those symptoms. They just cause you to feel you know, very fatigued and low energy. And as a result, you start going through these ideas like, oh, am I having all this, these, these symptoms like breast implant illness? And I think some people like to feed into that. I think that, that, that feeding into that is also encompassed by the, 
you know, the idea that the breast implants are these toxic bags of unhappiness. And I think, you know, a lot of people will, will read into those implants and the, and the, the substances that go into them. Um, but these are, you know, they're very, very well tested. They're, these are things that have been tested for quite a few years. Um, they're approved by multiple, um, you know, drug administration company or drug administration government um, uh, corporations around the world and various governments have, have, have also deemed them to be safe based on their toxicological um, um, profiles and, and, and whatnot. So I think some of the, some of the stuff that, that is in those um, or online can sometimes be a little bit maybe exaggerated. Um, and really a lot of it is just looking at your own personal symptoms and your own personal um, um, circumstances. I think, uh, you know, I've got my own opinions about some of those things that are said online and I don't necessarily believe a lot of it. Um, I guess to put a lot of people's, you know, fears at risk, things like the FDA, the FDA did a study in um, I it was 2007 or 2009 looking specifically at breast implant illness because there were a lot of people online back then talking about it. And they, they did a you know, long-term study and, and various things. And this is a government organization. This wasn't a private organization. And they deemed that there was no such thing as breast implant illness and that it was just a conglomeration of other issues that were going on. And it, it's one of those things that, 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 that has been around for a while. It's not something really new. It's just all of a sudden gained traction, I think, because of the size of social media. Um, people do like to talk on, online and they like to share the symptoms, which I think is really good. Um, the problem is, you know, trying to link some of those things to some of the issues around, again, you know, this sort of fatigue and pain and brain fog and, and lo you know, loss of energy. I've got to be honest, you know, you talk to anybody, we all have busy lives. We're all running after kids and, you know, busy jobs and you've got juggle five and six and seven things on the go. I mean, I can't remember the last time I got home and <laughs> didn't feel like I had a bit of the brain fog and was really tired. So I think it's pretty common. I think the issue is that it's, it, it, you know, generally if it's, if it's potentially a capsular contracture, I think it's one of those things that, that is great to go out and, and have a, uh, you know, just a frank discussion with, with your plastic surgeon or someone you've had and just say, look, what do you think? You know, do my symptoms stand up? I'm very sympathetic to women who come in and say, I think I've got these symptoms. We're like, yeah, cool. Let's, let's run through it and see what we've got. Um, I think with, um, particularly with, with um, some of the symptoms, um, when women get their implants out, they do feel better. And I think it's, that's all the evidence that I need as a, as a surgeon is that if, if I've done a good service for them. But again, if we go back to that, you know, this explanation here with these, you know, these three different outcomes potentially for women. Yeah, one, two, and three. Some of them improve after getting their implants out. Some don't. It's a little bit hard to say. Um, and But usually if I see women come in and they just read something online and they think maybe I've got these symptoms, um, for those women, if they're not convinced that they want to get their implants out, then all we do is an MRI. If the implants are unruptured, then I'm happy to leave them in and we just watch them over the next six months. And if they just feel like they're just not happy with things, then yeah, let's let's go ahead and, and, and talk about what we can do to, to remove them. Um, so I think even though the, the size of, the, of, of those uh, Facebook groups are not, you know, not small, I mean, that's the size of a lot of small towns around the country. I would say that some of the information that they do um, go through is a little bit um, maybe, you know, unsubstantiated. I think you can't, I can't unsubstantiate patient symptoms because there's a reason they come see me. So I, I believe all my patients when they come and say that they've got these issues, but it's not necessarily breast implant illness. Sometimes it's other things as well. Um, and some of those actual medical problems that do come up, I think, you know, it's, it's important to see GP and maybe run through a few blood tests to rule out the common things like vitamin deficiencies or thyroid problems or whatever. Um, and sometimes doing those nice baseline things will, will really help. We'll head to the next question. Um, the next one was, I want implants, but I'm not sure which ones. Um, do I have a preferred brand of implants and are some better than others? And which ones do you use and why? All right, so preferred brands. So, uh, I mean, one of the important things with, with, with plastic surgeons within, within this industry is plastic surgeons are approached by lots of different companies. And all these guys want us to use their products and brands and, and everything else. 
and and you know some companies will give us you know special deals on things. They'll say, look, if you if you want this, you can sell it on to your your patients. So one of the most important things, and I sort of started this out right when I started my my practice, was I I am not here for any company. I'm here for my patients, and that's the bottom line. So if patients come to me and they say, look, I, I want to do an implant. Um, or I'm looking at breast implants, I'll, I'll go through all the brands that I'm happy to use because of their safety profile, because of their you know, you know, low complication profile, um, and any data that is, that is there. Um, one of the other important things is I don't on-sell implants. So um, I, I will never sell an implant to a patient. What they, I, you know, whatever deal I can get with the implant company is something I pass along to the patients directly. Um, because that's not something for me to be, um, you know, profiting from on that, on that basis. So from my point of view, I've got a very moral standpoint on that. And, and that is, that is very much my thing. I'm not, I'm not a shill of the, of the implant companies. I'm more than happy to talk about using their implants. So I will go to conferences and say, I use this brand or I use this brand, but at the same time I use, you know, several brands because they all have different benefits and different effects. Um, so for example, a um, straightforward, simple breast augmentation, I will use um, um, brands that um, I'll talk to patients about uh, specifically for their cosmetic or their aesthetic goals. Um, and so if some patients want a very natural look, then we'll talk about using a teardrop implant. Um, if patients want a little bit more of an obvious look, then we'll look at a round implant. For the round implants, um, again, generally, as we talked about with these different types of implants, with a round one and a, and a textured one, um, it, it has to do with, with the different applications. So you can't sort of throw one of these into every single patient and say, you know, that's, that's the one I use. I always use it. It's good enough. Well, not really. Like there's different circumstances where, you know, these kind of implants are, are really good and they're, they do help and they help to, to, to deal with certain uh, issues that some people have. Maybe their chest wall is slightly different shaped. Maybe they've got a little bit of asymmetry. Um, maybe they've got a tuberous breast. And in which case I really want to use a certain type of implant. Um, so uh, from my point of view, I, I generally, you know, there are ones that I, that I generally use for certain applications. Um, and it, again, depends on the patient's aesthetic goals, depends on where they're going with it, and it depends on what we start with. So um, I think it's um, not one size fits all. Certain implants companies are, are good at some things, but they're not good at others. And so, yeah, for all those things that, that I've already discussed, you know, I'm just not a big fan of just committing to just one. Um, so the, the, the reasons I use these ones, these are a sixth generation implant. These are a brand called Motiva. Um, they're, they're good evidence and good data to suggest that they have a very low capsular contracture rate. Um, they're very strong and they're very robust. And to be honest, the company gives a good warranty on them. Um, and I like using them. I think patients are very happy with these. I get very, very few complications with them, so I'm happy to use them. Um, for a long time, I did use macro textured implants. Macro textured implants are um, um, that you know they're they're a good device if used properly. You know, there is this issue with ALCL now, and we can't ignore it, can't deny it. So I have stopped using these. The issue now is there are very few um, alternatives to using these. Mentor or Johnson and Johnson certainly does make a um, an anatomical implant. The only issue with uh, Johnson Johnson is they're a macro textured implant as well. Um, they also have had incidences of ALCL. So despite the fact that they are there, um, there, is that, there is also that risk for those. Um, the um, other issues with some of the other implants, so smooth round implants, uh, some um, surgeons will use these, and I think these are, they're very good um, um, implants as well. Very similar to these ones, which are the Motivas. Um, they do act very similar, but I do find these ones the gel in these ones is, is quite good, just a personal preference. I think patients, when they have a little feel of them, they're, they're pretty happy as well. Um, I've missed a few of the questions here, so I'll just go back and grab them. Um, Eileen, you've asked me if there's a higher likelihood of a capsule contractor if someone has a pre-existing autoimmune disease. I, I don't know that, um, um, I, Eileen. I'm going to have to research that and see. I think a lot of people will look at the other way around. So they feel that if they've had implants, they 
that they can actually lead to an autoimmune disorder. But I'm not really too sure about having autoimmune disease increasing your risk of capsular contracture. I'll have a look and see if there's any specific data on that, but I, I, will, I will get back to you on that one. So I'm going to pin that one and come back to it. Uh, Nancy, do I recommend on block if a rupture is known to be present? Um, no. So again, that, that technique is just a technique. Um, it's, a, it's a nice way to take out an, an implant if it is ruptured, but it doesn't necessarily prevent us from taking it out. Most plastic surgeons have a, a really good routine of, of approaching a, a ruptured implant, and a lot of it has to do with just um, using an empty bottle to actually suck the implant, the ruptured contents outside of the capsule, and then going back and, and removing the capsule as a whole, so doing a completion total capsulectomy. Again, the end point is the same. We're removing all the contents, we're removing the, the capsule, um, everything gets a good wash, everything gets a good clean, um, and all this you know, ruptured silicon or anything that's there is, is always removed. So is it, is it absolutely necessary? Again, it's a technique. It's just a you know, clean way of doing it, but in some cases, um, you really have to almost do a very, very, very wide incision along the lower part of the breast in order to get full access at that capsule. Um, hi, Roz, good to see you. Thanks very much, I really appreciate it. And Rachel, good to see you as well. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so Sharni just asked a quick question um, about uh, researching, so requirement post weight loss. How often do implants require replacement or revision? So life of an implant, most manufacturers will say anywhere from 10 to 15 years. So what does that mean? Um, so if I look at um, a patient getting implants at the, you know, 2025, generally they're gonna have to get a removal uh, of those implants or, or replacement within 10 to 15 years. Now I've got an implant on my desk that I'm gonna grab here. So this implant I took out um, several months ago. So this implant here is 30 years old um, and it's still intact. This was taken out of a patient who uh, had her implants done way back in the, in the 80s and that implant is still intact. So they can last for a very, very long time. Um, these new ones are, again, the, the newly manufactured ones are very good. A lot of it has to do, again, with you know patients taking care of the implants themselves. So certainly if that person um, who had those implants in loved to do kickboxing, loved to do you know high impact sports, they're just that slightly higher risk that those implants as they age can can potentially wear out or rupture. Ruptures are generally caused early on from significant trauma. So rather than a manufacturing defect, it's usually a significant trauma that causes it. So how significant? Car accidents, um, you know, injuring yourself by hitting, uh, you know, a, an inanimate object. Um, we haven't, in Brisbane, we have the Lime scooters, and I'm not sure if we've had any um, stories of ruptured implants as a result of Lime scooter falls, but I'm sure it's coming. But I guess the idea that I'm trying to convey there is that um, implants are generally very, very robustly built. With age and with time, your body is gonna be constantly trying to break that implant down. So these shells that are initially built on these implants will thin as time continues. And as a result, as they get older, there's a higher chance that they will rupture. So when they're young, they're very robust and very strong. You know, we can pull these things for you know, a long time and they're fine. You know, we can step on these and they're, and they're, they're quite strong. Um, but would I do that with this implant? No way. So I know if I did that with this implant, I'd have silicone all over my lap. So these ones are, and I can feel the implants on these, so the, the, the caps on these very, very, very thin. So um, yeah, with age, most implant manufacturers would say somewhere between 10 and 15 years, it's probably a nice time to kind of change. And again, at that stage, if there's things like capsule contracture, if you do have problems, then that's where that decision point comes as to what we want to do. Um, capsule contracture isn't, isn't an easy thing to deal with. Uh, even just taking out uh, the implant, even taking out the, the capsule, we still have to deal with the pocket, you know, the new pocket of putting things in, and that's a, a bit of a technical challenge. Um, Sharni, uh, next question was, what's the likelihood of a body rejecting an implant? Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, an interesting question. I do see that one online from time to time. So. 
the body generally won't reject it. So there's there's a there's one of those things where the body doesn't see it as um, foreign and try and push it out. Um, what generally the body will do with with an implant or anything that's been put in, and that is things like you know you injure your hand and you get a pin and plate in it. If you get a knee replacement, if you get a hip replacement, um, if you get a porta calf for for um, any sort of uh, chemotherapy treatment or something like that, your body generally doesn't reject those because they're all made from inert materials, meaning your body doesn't look at it as something really bad. Same thing with breast implants; they're very they're very much engineered around inert materials. So silicon is very inert, um, and as a result, your body doesn't reject it. The, the only time that it, it, there's a problem is if it gets infected. So if there's an infection that happens in the early stages after the operation, um, or potentially there's been a you know, technical error, or um, there are other medical problems, like you, you don't heal well as a result of an autoimmune disease, or you don't heal um, very well because of rheumatoid arthritis, or whatever it might be. Um, those are the issues that we see um, with an innate inability to actually make it through the, the operation and, and, and recover very well. And that has a lot to do with, obviously, with our training, patient selection, and making sure we've actually got the correct patient for the correct surgery. Um, and so from my point of view, um, sorry, I just thought someone was coming in. My point of view, the, um, um, the big issues there are, um, again, selecting that the right patient to do the um, um, to do that operation. So as a result, the rejection of the implant generally doesn't happen. That's more of a, a patient selection issue potentially on the, on the surgeon's point of view. Nancy, um, with extra capsular contracture or extra capsular rupture, does silicon migrate from the area through the body? So yes and no. It's sort of a I've seen some really bad ruptures as an extra capsular ruptures that will actually go into the muscle. So that goes into the, the muscle that overlies the, the chest wall, which is the pec major muscle. And of course, as you move that muscle, that silicon will actually move within the um, um, the muscle and actually get worse and worse with time. So generally with those ones, what we do see is um, the muscle will actually uh, become contaminated with silicon and end up um, uh, just very solid and actually kills the muscle. Those are pretty extreme examples. I've, I've, I've seen those ones a couple of times and those are usually patients with 30 to 40 year old implants um, and they refuse to get them taken out despite the constant pain and issues that they have. Um, will that silicon migrate throughout other parts of the body? And the answer is um, to a certain extent, yes. So if those that silicon gets into lymph nodes, uh, that, that, that lymphatic fluid will take it to um, other parts of the body like the liver, where it's usually it's disposed of, um, but it doesn't end up in areas like your, you know, your brain or your heart or anything like that. It generally just gets digested and um, um, you eliminate it as you normally would with a lot of other substances. I'll head on to the next question here. Um, how much do I charge for implants? Ballpark figure. So it really depends. Um, depends on the a lot of things. So um, as a class surgeon, I will generally see um, recon patients or reconstructive patients, things like tubular breasts. And with those patients, there's a Medicare item that we can use. If there's a Medicare item, then that means that the implants can actually be charged through a private health fund, or they can actually, in fact, be picked up by Medicare themselves. If we're looking at purely cosmetic, um, you know, it, it, it depends on, on the size of the implant, the type of the implant. Um, and I think that range for most plastic surgeons is pretty standard. It's anything from, you know, usually about 9,000 up to about 11,000 or $12,000. Um, and that should generally include a lot of things. I would say it should include um, a good pre-op discussion. It shouldn't be rushed. It shouldn't feel um, like as if you haven't had a say. Um, you should be able to express you know, what your aesthetic goals are. So what do you want to get out of a, of a, of a breast implant um, um, operation? Um, you should be able to um, discuss post-operative care, post-operative treatment. And to be honest, any, any operation that I've ever done for my patients, I'm more than happy to see them back 
happy to see them back, you know, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, yearly basis. The door is always open. And I think for anyone who's breast implant patients, I would, you know, I'm more than happy to see them again and again and again. And any patients that I generally see would know that, uh, you know, my door is always open and I'm always more than happy to see them. Um, any concerns they have, doesn't even matter, has to do with the breast implants. They can come in and talk to me about the weather. I'm more than happy to see them. Um, so I think it, it really depends on, 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 on who you see, but from my point of view, really what our goals are there are to um, be able to provide patients with what they need and, and to express the, the concerns they have. Um, and um, for you know the money that you pay, you should be able to get that back from your surgeon. And I think that's you know we, we that's definitely what we provide. Um, do you have a surgeon info night? So I've seen some surgeons have them. Um, we haven't started that yet. So I think um, a lot of what I would do is is certainly some of the body contouring surgery. It's probably the majority of the work that we do. Um, and we haven't really done. Um, some of the some of the info nights. I think the info nights are really good for patients who are just a little bit unsure if they want to go ahead with it. They don't really have that confidence to come in and say, "Look, I want to sit down and actually want to go forward to it." Um, for me personally, I think any patient can come in and, and do it. I don't try and talk them into surgery. I explain to them the options and we want to go through it. it. Shouldn't feel pressured. I think one of the things that patients shouldn't feel if you walk into a consult and you feel like you're being sold something might not be the best thing. Patients, generally from my point of view and what I've, what I've learned and, and the way I've trained is my job is to provide education and to provide examples of, of what can be done. Patients, I think nowadays are very, very well informed for what they do. You know, certainly these online forums are fantastic. I think they provide a very good support for patients, but I also think they provide really good examples of, of what's available. And I think um, um, my job is not to sell. I'm not here to sell, but I'm here to educate patients and to to help them through a lot of the you know their weight loss journey or even their 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 breast journey as well. Um, but I think yeah, importantly, um, don't it, there's there's more than one plastic surgeon out there. Don't feel like you need to go to just one. It's certainly a really good idea to do a bit of research. And so I feel that. To provide individualized care for patients, I'm more than happy to sit down with them and, and you know, two, three, four times before any surgery because they should feel comfortable with it. It's your surgery. It's not for me to tell you what to do. I'm here to help you along. Um, but individualized care is very, very important. And um, I think um, while you know some of the information nights are good, I think it's generic information personally. Um, so that's why we haven't really jumped into it yet. I think if we get more requests for it, I'd be more than happy to do it. Um, but it's just the same as sitting down for a consult and asking those questions yourself personally. Um, so we'll go to the uh, last one. Um, how long after getting implants can you one drive? So I think that a lot is really just how you feel. Everyone recovers slightly differently. So if you feel like driving is, is, is comfortable and safe after two weeks, I think that's perfectly reasonable. If you feel like you're, you're comfortable and safe to drive after one week, I also think that's reasonable. The next day, probably not a good idea. Um, but really, it's just a matter of being safe on the road. Um, I think one of the last thing you want to do is, is either cause an accident or an injury to somebody else. And so if you feel like you're not safe, then probably not ready to drive yet. But really, the big important thing is... Um, your, your feet work, so you can operate the pedals, your arms are probably the one thing you need to be able to do emergency maneuvers when you're, when you're um, after an operation. And if you feel like you're a bit sore when you're doing those kind of things, sometimes it's literally getting in behind the wheel and actually doing those maneuvers and trying to do the, you know, hand over hand. And if you struggle with that, then probably not, not, not time, but, but you, you, most patients usually are kind of ready to, to, to um, jump behind the wheel when they feel they're ready. I think I take the same sort of philosophy when it comes to post-operative recovery. Um, for a lot of operations, I think, look, it's day two, day three. For some simple operations, maybe it's time to go home, but I don't say anything. I just generally let patients decide when they're ready to go home. Some patients take a week, some patients take two days. It's really just up to them. I, 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 one of the worst things I can do is walk in and tell a patient to go home when they're not ready, because that means they're gonna go home when they're unsafe. So I think for patients, same thing. A lot of that is self-regulating when you feel ready to drive. When you're ready, you kind of know when you're ready. 
Um, how long after getting implants can you go to the gym? So as a general rule, um, for a lot of my patients, I'm very, very conservative. I would say three months. So why three months? Where does that number kind of come from and where does that time come from? Now, the big important thing like capsule contracture, which we've talked about earlier, your body needs to heal by scar. And it takes about three months for your body to get an adequate scar tissue that's going to hold those implants in place. Um, at about four to six weeks is when you usually start feeling really good. Some of the inflammation has gone, everything's kind of starting to soften up and that's kind of the worst time to do it because at four to six weeks, all that capsule is converting from a real soft scar tissue into a sort of a strength soft tissue. And at that four to six week mark is at that point where it's quite, quite weak. Um, and we know this because of patients, for example, who injure their hands, they get a tendon injury. It's the exact same thing. At four to six weeks, they feel really good. They're like, all right, cool. I'm going to go out and start you know, opening door handles and start doing things. And it's literally something as simple as that. And they rupture their tendon repair. And we know that the exact same type of scar tissue happens in your breasts. And it's, you know, breasts implants are not light. And they're constantly pressing, pressing on that scar tissue. So if you... Um, you know, get behind a bench press and start putting all this pressure right on your implant, potentially that implant is going to be pushed down and we're going to end up with problems like double bubbles, uh, bottoming out and, and all those other kind of issues, which of course we don't want. And so generally I would tell most patients that at about three months is the time when you can start doing high impact stuff, running, jogging, um, F45, all that sort of stuff. Um, but before then, just just hold off. You know, it's 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 important to to remember the investment you've made, and 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 you know, really, I guess it's it's just it's one of those things you just want to be very very safe with. Um, the next uh, thing is um, when can you pick up young children? So hers are two and five. So when can you pick up children? I think again, same thing. Whenever you feel comfortable. Um, um, generally, if you're going to be doing the big lifts way out front. Um, that's going to be a little bit difficult, um, but you know, picking up something on the on your hip isn't going to be too bad. Um, but again, if it's you, you, with a lot of these operations, you have to think like a child. And what does that mean? It, it really just means that if it's sore, don't do it. So adults have a really weird way of thinking that if it's sore, I can just put a push through the pain and it'll be good. And that's the wrong way to think about it. The best way to think about it is if it's sore, I'm going to pull back. And it's tough because, again, we all live busy lives. We've got kids. We've got this thing. And you kind of don't want to feel like as if you can't do it. So you know, don't feel bad about it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just part of the healing process afterwards. And that's natural. That's just one of those natural things that needs to happen. Um, last two are how long after implants can you do yoga and everything you did before? So it's one of those gradual increases in um, activity. So, again, Pain is your guide. So it's not the thing you need to overcome, but it's the, it's the thing that's guiding you as to how much you can do. So certainly for yoga, I think one of the big things is obviously some of the big stretches and some of the big movements. Those are the things you kind of want to avoid until you sort of hit that three month mark where everything's a little bit more solid and sitting a bit better. You can certainly lead up to that for a couple of, couple of weeks prior, um, but for the most part, yeah, doing anything up to that point, anything high impact or big stretches you really want. Um, and getting back to you before, you know, same thing, you know, really you can start hitting it up pretty hard in about three months, you know, doing your swimming, you can start um, getting to the gym, doing some high impact stuff. But even then, most patients will still say, I still feel a little bit swollen, it still, still feels not 100%. And that's fine, you just kind of pull back and, and, and get back into it as you see fit. Um, a lot of problems, again, if you have any issues, you just approach your surgeon and ask them if they can give you a hand. Um, all right, so I think we've got to the end of it. Is there any other questions that anybody has if they want to write anything online? Um, Trish gave me a whole bunch of questions um, beforehand. So she did fabulous work for, for including all those questions. Thanks very much, Trish. Um, and um, um, I think uh, Eileen, I'm going to have a little look into that question that you asked me. I'm not really too sure of the exact answer, but I will get that back to you um, within the next couple of days. It's an interesting question. As I said, I've, I've heard it back the other way, but, uh, but not that way. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Sorry for dragging you out of a, of a Thursday night. 
Um, happy to answer questions if there's anything, certainly get in touch. Um, happy to hear from everybody. And again, thanks for a wonderful, uh, thanks for a wonderful uh, Facebook Live.